morning and good afternoon, depending where you are in the U.S. Um, I'm Alex cornell Dehu, and I'm president and co-founder of Elected Officials to Protect America. EOPA is a network of elected officials from across the U.S. who are dedicated to protecting our planet from the climate crisis. Particularly in this press conference, we'll be focusing on the dangers of energy security as it relates to climate change. And today is World Water Day. <clears throat> and this is particularly important because we all understand how the connection between water and energy is unbelievably vital for our prosperity as a country and our international security. <clears throat> for instance, when I was deployed out to Iraq, when I was in the Marine Corps, we came across a line of cars, trucks, and tractors as long as I could see. It was about dusk and we got to the front and realized they were teeing up for oil and gas to fuel their livelihood, really. And the curfew was about to come, and so we started to try to break up the crowd, but instead they rioted. They were willing to risk their lives because they're dependent on a single source of energy. And likewise, we're lined up to Putin's gas pump right now. We're dependent, Europe's dependent, um, and actually the US is a little less dependent on it, but Europe is very dependent on Putin's gas pump. And so we're gonna focus on some of the amazing solutions we have to get reduce that dependency uh, because it is an international security threat that we're dependent on countries like uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, um, Kuwait, Bahrain. And the thing that's common with all these countries is they're autocratic leaders, they're not democracies. And that's not uh, prosperous for the world's security. So with that, we have a distinguished uh, panel here of veterans who have experienced many stories like the one I mentioned firsthand or have deeply been working in this arena. Um, so we're going to go around in about five minutes each and give an opening statement, and then we'll take your questions. Um, so first, we have Dr. Julia Nesquit. Uh, she's a member of the Consensus for American Security Network, a U.S. Army military intelligence veteran as well. Doctor, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alex, so much. And thanks for, for having me and to join a team uh, of esteemed colleagues uh, here today. And as you said, uh, on, on the actual World Water Day is, is couldn't be more timely. Um, in fact, the theme I think for this year is uh, groundwater making the invisible visible. So there's certainly a lot of um, effects when it comes to agriculture and industry and ecosystems that also affect our climate adaptation. So great to speak today um, on these issues. I mean, a lot of that's gonna certainly tie to current events such as Ukraine, as we all uh, are following this very closely. But, but as you said, in an age where there are autocrats and dictators, particularly in Russia and Venezuela and Iran that have grown wealthy off of oil and gas today. And, and then of course the timeliness of the UN's uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change IPCC report that was just recently released. Um, it, again, it couldn't be more dire and, and critical of what's happening and what nations are doing and not doing uh, these days. So um, with that, you know, when you think about the war right now in Ukraine, it certainly brings a lot of that uh, truth to home, um, particularly in the energy sector. Uh, as we all know, Europe relies on Russian fossil fuels um, with annual oil exports about 40% of demand across the continent. Um, there's a, certainly an ongoing dependency that has created a security risk, uh, which certainly has put a, um, a sovereign democratic nation in Putin's crosshairs, uh, unfortunately. And again, as we've been following the war, you know, Putin's economic strategic leverage, you know, with the oil and gas sector that makes up over 50% of its country's exports has fueled this kind of war machine. I mean, energy is a weapon for him, as we as we all know, and continue to follow. Um, but with this war, it's certainly created an international uh, humanitarian crisis um, of epic proportions, as there's been, um, I think, around 3 million now refugees that have fled uh, with innocent people that have died. Uh, so when we think about this war in Ukraine, um, that's bolstered by, you know, over 285 million in oil payments that are made every day by European countries, uh, that dependency and that reliance, it's just, there's so many lessons learned and uh, a lot that we can learn here on the home front as well. 
as oil and gas accounts for about 40%, I believe, of the Russian federal budget. So we're certainly supporting and fueling them in some ways, um, even with sanctions and, and um, even though their economy is also hurting at this point in time. And then if we think back in uh, 2014, uh, the same year Russia annexed uh, Crimea and then the North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization Secretary General Anders Rasmussen even actually warned that Russia was working to undermine European and US fossil fuel production. So a lot of pieces there to that puzzle that, that shouldn't be a surprise. And then you think about all these other threat multipliers that, that are out there um, with the, even the Pentagon that called on global warming as a threat multiplier back in 2014. Um, and all the implications that would affect US national security interests um, over the years that ha also have these aggravated existing problems such as poverty and social tensions, um, environmental degradation, uh, leadership issues, weak political institutions. I mean, I can go on and on about the threats of the domestic stability in a number of, of countries uh, from that standpoint. And then look at you know the over 1.1 billion people worldwide that uh, lack access to water. Uh, a, a total of 2.7 billion uh, find water scare, scarce for at least a month a year. Um, and climate, the climate change issues is certainly making that reality um, worse as we see, we're seeing more droughts, of course, um, that are exasperating the situation that lead to conflict. Um, in my past roles in government, um, we've seen a lot, especially in the Middle East and other areas where there's been these water conflicts and they have gone up over the past couple decades. You have farmers and herders that clash in parts of Africa over this access to water. Um, and again, you know, there, there's even these anti-government protests that have erupted in Iran uh, not too long ago, also over water issues. So water sharing, you know, has even become a rival in issues with between the Soviet states as well as Central Asia, where I've traveled quite a bit and. Um, even an example would be the Amudera River. Uh, so a lot of great examples there, but we look back the past two decades, a fourth of the conflicts triggered by access to water have been um, three main regions, I would say, the Middle East, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and you're seeing reports you know, from the United Nations, for example, where uh, almost two, almost a dozen or over a dozen, I would say, countries in Africa with a total population of 500 million people that face these water insecurity issues. Um, look at places in Chad and Niger and Somalia, Somalia, for example. And again, a lot of them will continue to face higher levels of risk because of extreme weather events, um, which is outpacing these countries' ability to adapt. Um, again, another conflict with, with Afghanistan uh, is another example with uh, over 22 million people, that's, which is over half the, the population are also experiencing high levels of food shortages, of which we've all heard um, severe drought has also hit that area as well, the country crippling food production, forcing people from their land. Uh, so again, you, you start to travel all throughout the world and you see these, these similarities and these themes. And then going back to the Ukrainian war, um, there too are uh, very much it's jeopardizing food supplies. Ukraine and Russia are, are, are critical when it comes to food suppliers, especially for the low and middle income countries where there's tens of millions of people already uh, food insecure and their exports exports were responsible, believe it or not, for about 26% of the global wheat in, in 2020 uh, as well. So, you know, I, I'd say a key theme that needs to be done is diversification of our supply, uh, particularly in the energy sector, clean energy sector, that could help protect not just Europe, but Americans from volatile, dangerous, you know, fossil fuel economy, with infl inf inflation and so forth. Um, but clean energy, certainly can be a part of our energy security when it comes to being safe and reliable and affordable. It can create jobs, it can grow our economy, and it certainly can protect lives. Um, if we're able to really feed these diverse energy sources into our grid, uh, it could insulate us from the fluctuations, again, of fossil fuel prices. And as you said, autocrats who wield their oil and gas reserves as weapons. Uh, you know, the when it comes to the security of, of, of peaceful democratic nations that rely in part of diversifying that supply, uh, it can also be done by curbing greenhouse gas emissions and the dependency, of course, on single source fuels. Um, so with that, I know there's discussion about the Defense Protection Act and what, what can be done there. If we can first 
you know, and foremost, remove barriers to increase domestic supply, I think that could be very helpful. Um, but the president can certainly use his executive powers to try to weaken the, the geopolitical power of fossil fuels, particularly abroad, and, and, and prevent further mass suffering uh, that, that is occurring because of these wars that where energy is being used as a, as a weapon. It could also use, be used to accelerate the production of clean energy uh, manufacturing that could cut Putin's finances and help alleviate um, our dependence as well as Europe's. Um, you know, again, the, the influence of autocratic countries hold due to their oil and gas production, and that has to that has to end. Uh, so again, it could fuel our manufacturing companies with um, a way to direct and, and expand production of clean energy technologies, and, and we've we've become so far from that from that sense. Um, and again, with the crisis unfolding in, in Ukraine, you know, for the sake of humanity, um, you know, we really need to change course and act on our energy supply chains. Uh, that, to me, has uh, become more and more dire. Uh, so there's an opportunity of global clean energy uh, that can be that can affect our economy and that can be boundless in, in a lot of ways. Um, and businesses can start to direct, and I'm talking about U.S. businesses here. Uh, can be directed to really prioritize whether it's contracts for materials um, that are deemed necessary for national defense um, that could allow the president to really designate those materials, uh, especially to be prohibited from price gouging and hoarding and that sort of thing. Um, and then just real quickly, uh, what, as I mentioned and, and discussed clean energy and how that can grow and help our economy and save lives. Again, it's important that it's safe and affordable and reliable, of course, but you know, when it comes to energy and climate provisions, there's a lot gonna, that's under consideration right now in Congress. So it's, it's gonna be interesting to watch that where it could also reduce annual US oil consumption, at least by you know, 180 million barrels per year by the year 2030, which is just around the corner. So there's a lot of opportunities and a lot that can be done even on the Hill in Washington, DC. Um, lots of great opportunities where, where our national, our nation's largest investment in a, a clean energy transition would certainly bring a safer environment, environmental um, aspect to, especially to communities that have been ne neglected um, and, and being able to grow the economy. So, um, and then finally, uh, turning it back to, to Russia, uh, you know, they could never become an oil and gas superpower without the help of of other countries and other uh, companies. So I think it's important to call them out um, where we can. Um, it's certainly been a chessboard, if you will, for Europe and Russia um, and a lot of lessons learned um, on the home front. You know, Europe had built its defenses since the energy crisis of 2006 and 2009. Uh, Ukraine used to be this energy transit country and that role has now shrunk. So hopefully with today's Europe's you know, European dependence on, on Russia, uh, hopefully that will dwindle. And, um, and, and here in the United States, we can learn from that. Um, and that's, I think, something to watch the front of with this, as this crisis continues to unfold. So a lot, a lot to be happening there. And again, quite apropos, especially on World Water Day, where uh, the water piece of this is certainly goes hand in hand with the energy crisis. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, doctor, uh, particularly uh, with the World Water Day crisis. When I was in Afghanistan, they actually, the Taliban tweeted out, hey, we're taking the city of Farah for the water. And actually, we're pretty blunt about it. Um, likewise, in Iraq, um, when someone tried to blow our vehicle up, when we caught him, uh, he was found out to be a farmer who had lost his crops due to a massive drought that's happening. Um, mm -hmm. So we can see some of the direct tactical connections, but also on the strategic side, where Putin uh, leverages Wagner and Libya to take control of the aqueduct system that controls Tripoli. So uh, there are many facets, facets to this that you very eloquently uh, outlined. Um, so we're gonna take it from more of the international and now head out to Arizona uh, with Representative Richard Andre, who's uh, also a member of the EPA Leadership Council and an Air Force veteran. Hello, everyone, and good morning. We're still in the morning time here in Arizona, but thank you uh, for the elected officials to protect America when it comes to um, the crisis that we're currently in, because we are in a crisis. We are in a global warming, and we all know we are. What has led to this um, has been significant with, uh, with us not going the right direction to protect the planet and, and especially to protect the, protect the United States. Because what we have seen is this is a threat. This is a security threat to our nation on, on how we're gonna be able to function uh, later on in the future. 
rising seas, which is very concerning because a lot of our coastal cities are, are in threat of that. I personally have experienced that um, when we travel outside of the state and go to my favorite Pacific Island, uh, Hawaii, jumping in the ocean and the water is warmer than it has been. Learning that it's the water temperature has risen by two, to, two degrees is a lot of water to heat up. Knowing that this is a threat uh, to the United States and to other countries, we have seen uh, what's going to, uh, what's occurring. Like here in Arizona, we're in the middle of a drought. And why is that significant? Because if we're suffering the effects of a drought, so are other parts of the nation. Farmers in South America are now migrating out of South America, America due to the lack of water. We're talking about migration patterns changing because when, what do people do when you no longer have water in a certain area? You can't grow crops, you can't put food on the table. So you end up migrating to another part of the world. And we're gonna see this uh, significant amount of migration occurring because we're experiencing it in other parts of the world, which was stated earlier. We're talking about, and if we can't have widespread water and there's only certain locations, what ends up happening? And as was mentioned earlier, uh, people become desperate and what do they do? They arm themselves and they fight over water. But what has led to all this? What is the main uh, thing that we're talking about? on using fossil fuels and everything associated with fossil fuels, we have seen an increase in our oil prices, in our gas prices, in our energy costs. I always relate it to this. When energy costs go up, who absorbs it? We do. Uh, families, working families absorb the higher energy costs. And we're seeing that today. These oil companies, especially, are making billions in profits. Last year, the profits were in the billions of dollars and we saw gas prices rising. Here, for example, in Arizona, gas was up to $4.49 a gallon. And I would point out to coworkers who were complaining about the high gas prices, said, do you know if they cut the price of gas by 50%, their profits would still be in the billions of dollars. And we have seen that today with the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, the, the monster, the, the energy uh, that's uh, being sold to other countries, not, you know, the United States uh, recently had in place an embargo, but European countries who are feeding into that war machine because that's how Putin is actually uh, paying for the cost of the war, paying for the cost of that conflict, is through profits through the oil and through uh, fossil fuels. That is why it's important because I always say this, we do have the technology, we should use it. That's why I'm encouraging President Biden to invoke the Defense Production Act to accelerate a clean energy uh, transition. Because the other aspect is I do come from labor. I belong to a union. We have the workers, the skilled workers <clears throat> to be able to transition over to clean energy. We always talk about what, how we're gonna prepare for that, for the jobs and everything. While labor is ready and we do have the resources and the technology as well as the skilled workforce to be able to transition to jobs because that's what we're talking about when we talk about clean energy growing the economy to save lives because once again um, we need to, when we're doing away with these uh, fossil fuel uh, jobs they can transition because at the end of the day it comes back down to this being able to have the ability to put food on the table and to pay for that food and, and that's one way we could do it as well relying on labor unions to bring the resources and the workforce to transition to the clean energy jobs. Uh, once again, when it comes to the war in Ukraine, seeing that Putin is um, going, wasting no expense to uh, overtake Ukraine. And this has led once again to a war, but I wanna remind everybody, not long ago, we were in another war that it was over oil. We were in Kuwait and eventually Iraq. What was the main driver of that? Once again, it, it was oil. We need to stop our reliance on oil and fuel and fossil fuels. And the only way we're gonna be able to do that is investing more into a, a clean energy, ensuring that we can stop some of these uh, actions, aggression, uh, acts of aggression into other countries because not only will we benefit, but the world will benefit as well. And our planet will benefit from going to clean energy as well. Once again, we're seeing the impacts and it is devastating. Um, we can stop most of this. We can stop what is occurring, 
by transition into clean energy. More importantly, the only way we're going to be able to hold these uh, countries from the aggressive tactics that they're taking is providing these jobs and providing this energy, clean energy. That way we don't have to worry about water. That way we don't have to worry about fueling the war machine and that's occurring today in, in Russia and against the Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's, it's coming home personally to Arizona, California, where Saudi Arabia and China and the UAE are buying up water rights in uh, our own country. And uh, our current laws make it legal for them to centrally ship water back to Saudi Arabia to feed 192,000 cows through the second most water intensive crop. Um, so this is deeply connected uh, to the economic security of the United States too which relates clearly to our um, international security. Um, great, so we're gonna head now uh, out east and uh, turn it over to Mark Turner, who's a supervisor in Virginia and a retired Air Force Colonel. Thanks, Alex. Um, and uh, as Alex pointed out, I'm a retired Colonel. Um, I thought it might be helpful, just some personal anecdotes from the very first part of my career and the very end of my career. Um, I uh, joined the Air Force after graduating from the Air Force Academy in 1973 as a second lieutenant and went through helicopter training and became an air rescue helicopter pilot. My first assignment was Thule, Greenland uh, at the high end of Baffin Bay. It's about 600 miles from the North Pole. I have pictures in my, my picture catalogs of um, standing with one foot on the tundra, the rock tundra and the, at the rock end of tundra of the mainland of Greenland and the other foot on the ice cap. And the ice cap in Thule went from sea level to 10,000 feet, two miles of solid ice. Um, we would fly up and down the coast periodically in the helicopter. And we had uh, wrecks from World War II shuttle services of B-17 bombers and B-25 bombers that had crashed on the ice that we had marked on the map so that we wouldn't think that they were wreckage if we had an active air mission. And it was an entire continent of solid ice. Today, I have heard that there are whole sections now of the Greenland ice cap that are now bare down to the tundra. That's 10,000 feet of ice that have melted in bare spots down to the tundra. And they are now examining areas of the continent of Iceland, or Greenland, sorry, Greenland, that, that have never been exposed to man before. They've never, human, human eyes have never looked at this tundra on the Greenland ice cap before. That's how much melt off we have going on. Now that was 1973. The big environmental issue in 1973 was fluorocarbons uh, punching a hole in the um, ozone layer. Uh, and that was, a, that was a big controversy. No one even talked about global climate change back then. And the notion that whole sections of the Greenland ice cap would be gone, were, would, it, was, it was laughable. No one even ever would have entertained that. I am recalled the uh, inconvenient truth, Vice President Gore's narrated documentary. And I remember it vividly because he mentioned this when the ice caps start to melt, it becomes a self sustaining process at some point. The water, the salinity in the ocean water becomes less saline and fresher and uh, does not as effectively reflect the sunlight. And that causes the, the heating process to, to accelerate that causes more fresh water runoff and it becomes a self-sustaining cycle. Uh, I personally think we are probably already into that cycle with the sea level rise around the, around the world. Um, fast forward to my uh, final assignment. My final assignment was on the Joint Staff and uh, Joint Chief Staff in, in DC in the Pentagon. Uh, my boss was Wesley Clark, um, who you see on TV all the time now uh, uh, as a uh, commentator, military commentator on the war in Ukraine. Um, he was a free star at the time, went on to be the NATO commander. I saw him bumped into him at a cocktail party. National Geographic had a documentary on some years later on called The Generals, and he was one of the generals they profiled. And I remember asking him that night, and this was years ago, I said, what's the number one threat, threat in the world today? And he said, Ukraine. This was easily 10, maybe 15 years ago. Um, and it, it, it was illustrative, but because not only was he able to predict it, 
but it tracked with a lot of what I was seeing on the joint staff. Now I happened to be the, the Africa branch chief. So I was in charge of Sub-Saharan Africa and um, military political policy in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and every day we read cable traffic from the 48 Sub-Saharan African countries. And I can tell you that what you look for, and we, there, were, there were conflicts all over the Sub-Saharan continent. And what you look for as triggers to conflicts was scarcity in whatever form that took water scarcity, energy scarcity, food scarcity, scarcity triggered conflict. Because invariably, if, if, if the scarcity impacted one country greater than another country, it set up the seeds for conflict. Um, and we would look for leverage. In any kind of, of, of a diplomatic discussion between countries, we look for what, are the, what is the comparative advantage between these countries? What is the leverage that these countries have? Um, and if, if you fast forward now with that thought process that we dealt with every day on the joint staff in strategic plans and policy, as we looked around the world, and now you look at uh, Vladimir Putin in Ukraine, he was encouraged to do this aggression, to commit this act of heinous aggression. He was specifically encouraged because he knew he had Europe in a stranglehold from fossil fuels. He knew he could leverage this option and there was very little Europe could do because they were so beholden to him on fossil fuels. There's a, another, as I was preparing for this, there was a, there's another aspect to it that is even to me more frightening, which kind of ties both the war in Ukraine and my first assignment. Global warming has really begun to melt the polar ice caps to such a degree now that Russia is able to go and drill for oil in pristine areas of the polar oceans that have never been available for drilling for oil. Now, number one, that, that strengthens his hand for, with, with a, 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 a increases his hand in fossil fuels. But number two, an oil spill in the polar oceans would be globally catastrophic. We all assume that Russia had an invincible army when they invaded Ukraine and this would last a week. And now we find out morale is low, the tactics are, are uh, substandard, the, the the training is substandard, and this is now the power that is going into the polar oceans to begin to drill for oil in the polar oceans that are incredibly fragile. Um, the, the, the national security implications around this concept of scarcity really, really hit home. I, I think the Defense Production Act is absolutely essential, and the reason for that, which, is, which we talked about and touched upon, is that the, the Oil companies, the fossil fuel companies, thrive on scarcity. That is what is driving their profit mechanism, scarcity. The scarcer those, those things are, the, the more powerful they are. We're paying four and a half dollars for a gallon of gasoline now for the first time in history. This is, a, this, is, this is boom time for the oil companies. The only way we are going to stop this leverage of scarcity in the energy industry is to transition to an energy source that is free and bountiful and unlimited. And that is clean energy. That's the only way we can stop this stranglehold that the oil companies have. So as much as we would like to compete economically with the oil companies within American government, they have enormous lobbying, enormous power because they wield so much power because of their leverage in the, in the oil industry. The only way we can break that is through things like the Defense Production Act, which cuts across the economic consent of that the oil companies have. I, I promise you the fossil fuel industry is working directly against us in our efforts against Vladimir Putin right now because he is an enormous uh, oil consumer and oil producer. Um, so the, the national security implications of all of this tie together, it's all integral and we have to break that chain somehow. I don't think we can compete economically. So I think the Defense Production Act is probably the most uh, reasonable way to go forward. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Uh, that's very true. The, po the point you made that the only way out of this is through clean energy, uh, particularly because even if we try to bump up production, it's six to nine months and we can ramp up renewables a lot quicker than the oil industry can ramp up uh, their production. Uh, and LNG capacity is at capacity anyway right now. So the way to help Europe is actually to get as much renewable energy to Europe as quickly as possible. Um, in the immediate sense, in the long-term sense, that scarcity is going to continue unless we deal with this structural problem. 
All right. So now let's head over to Pennsylvania uh, with council member uh, Joel Hicks, who is also Hi. a fellow Navy veteran. Absolutely. Thanks, Alex. Um, and th thank you all for um, being part of this event. Um, I'm a 20 year Navy veteran and retired as a Navy commander. Um, spent about half my career uh, operating nuclear submarines. Um, and I'll ask a question to everybody. How many times while we were deployed did we have to spend resources and time uh, refueling uh, with hydrocarbons? Um, the answer was zero times. Um, we could have some debate about where nuclear power fits in. Uh, I'm personally a big advocate. Um, it's not technically a renewable, uh, but um, I saw firsthand the strategic um, importance of not being reliable on hydrocarbons uh, from a military perspective. Um, I would like us, as we move forward to decarbonizing the energy grid, um, to keep nuclear power in the mix for consideration, as long as we can do it safely, as long as we could do it um, economically, we should consider all um, carbon-free sources. Um, and I, I think maybe we could all agree that um, Europe's energy security situation might be just a little bit better um, if they had a little bit more reliance on nuclear power, um, especially in, in Germany. Um, I want to take us back. I'm going to read something um, from the New York Times to you all. Um, it's quote, Iran, awash in oil money, thumbs its nose at the United Nations demands for, its de for it to desist in its nuclear adventures and daily threatens to wipe Israel off the map. President Vladimir Putin of Russia, awash in oil money, jails his opponents at home and cozies up to America's opponents like Iran and Hamas abroad. Sudan, a Washington oil money, ignores the world's pleas to halt its genocide in Darfur. Venezuela's president, a Washington oil money, regularly tells America and his domestic opponents to take a hike. Add Nigeria, Uzbekistan, Angola, Saudi Arabia, Chad, and Syria, all flush with oil and gas, are comfortably retreating from even baby steps of democratization. Um, that could be March 22nd, 2022. That's from an editorial in 2006 by Thomas Friedman. He calls it the first law of petropolitics and it posits the following, the price of oil and the pace of freedom always move in opposite directions in petro states. According to his first law of pet petropolitics, the higher the price of crude oil, the more erosion we see in petro states in, in the rights to free speech, free press, free elections, freedom of assembly, government transparency, an independent judiciary, and the rule of law, and in the freedom to form independent political parties and non-government organizations. Literally in the last 24 hours, President Putin's chief uh, political rival, Alexei Navalny, was just sentenced to nine years in prison on trumped up charges of fraud. We know what the effects of hydrocarbon rentier states have. And we do um, understand the effects it has on global security. Um, I, I don't think the narrative has really changed that much since Mr. Friedman's um, insightful observations um, uh, early in the 2000s. Um, I, I also am supportive of using all elements of um, our federal powers to deal with crisis. Um, our, our last large scale global oil crisis in 1973, the US actually acted very boldly. Um, federal action created the, uh, authorized the US's participation in the International Energy Agency. It created um, a strategic petroleum reserve um, to free up billions of gallons, millions of barrels of um, crude oil and to help offset um, the unpredictable nature of hydrocarbon rentier states, which is to say, which is not to advocate, we need a bigger strategic petroleum reserve, but it is to say, we know how to act boldly and we know how to use all the levers of 
federal power to improve our energy security. Um, I think the Defense Product Production Act can be one of those tools. Um, I am, I have, I'm on the record and feel strongly that the climate provisions and the Build Back Better, the $555 billion that was allocated to um, start and get a, a long way in our decarbonization of our energy grid and our transportation sector, we need to use all of these elements. Um, so the only way um, to free uh, democratic countries from the grip of autocratic oil producing nations is to accelerate this transition. Um, it's as true uh, when I was on a nuclear submarine as it is uh, for our, our, our nation here to free ourselves from um, the dependencies and from the corrupt nature um, that petrostates um, uh, yield and, and wield um, as we see um, quite, quite dramatically um, in the last several weeks. So I support these measures and look forward to the federal government taking um, the, the types of actions they have before um, and, and doing so um, to decarbonize um, our grid and our transportation sector. So thank you. I mean, that's a pretty wonderful uh, thought to be able to be free from the influence of a cartel of autocratic states. Um, and it's a very achievable one that we can do. Just like a nuclear submarine can go anywhere in the world, um, we should be able to have our own energy at home and abroad uh, that's not dependent on uh, dictators who don't have our interests in mind. All right, so we're going to head now to Council, uh, uh, sorry, Mayor uh, Derek Woods from Dumfries, Virginia. He's a Marine Corps veteran and uh, is doing some amazing things for his city. I, I think, Mayor, you're still on mute. Hey, still, well, look, we're still getting used to the uh, the COVID era of doing things and getting stuck on mute. But uh, thank you, Alex, for definitely putting this press conference together. I truly do attach myself to the comments of of all the colleagues here today on, at the press conference. As a uh, Marine Corps veteran, I remember um, working on Quantico in the Training and Education Command uh, uh, for the years that I did and responsible for looking at all the fuel efficiencies. I remember digging down as a comptroller, I had to really dig down into the numbers and look for the cost savings for the military as far as um, uh, what we could bring money, looking at those type of things. And uh, I truly want to stop first and acknowledge happy uh, World Water Day. Um, you know, a lot of people didn't know, you know, as I, I like to share interesting facts when I talk to the community is we observe this day on March 22nd every year. And I think it's really to educate about the importance of water uh, to the whole world and then to continue to raise awareness about the different water crisis. Here in uh, Dumfries, we have, uh, we're close to uh, three coal ash ponds that um, those coal ash ponds have leaked into our water and caused a little crisis in this area. Um, the power company was directed to get everybody in this community uh, who wanted to on public water and off of that well water because the well water uh, was contaminated as a result. Mm -hmm. And so uh, World Water Day is still important and is still relevant. You know, it definitely highlights the necessity for improvement to access to water, I think hygiene, facilities, and sanitation in all countries. I was just reading the other day that the United Nations University estimated that about 19 countries in Africa uh, with a total population of about 500 million people face water insecurities. And at the top of those lists, I think there were three countries that uh, we all know as no strangers to conflict, uh, Chad, uh, Niger, and Somalia. Uh, and then most nations on the continent face even higher levels of risk to extreme weather events, that as climate change makes them more frequent and more severe, outpacing uh, the country's ability to adapt. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago during uh, the State of the Union address, President Biden actually uh, reaffirmed his commitment to taking on climate action. And I think, you know, as a mayor, one of my top priorities is 
uh, not only the environment, but making sure that we develop and create good paying jobs to that then find a way to uh, cut pollution. Yes, Earth Day is coming up the first week of April. Uh, lower energy costs to be able to advance economic opportunity for everybody and to secure you know, energy for our future. And I know that uh, a lot of people say that coal ash, we can get away with that. A lot of our power companies are starting to look towards uh, a lot of wind and solar type options. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people say, how does this tie into what's happening uh, right now in, in our current? And, and I want to just say here publicly, as mayor, I stand uh, united with the people of Ukraine who they're standing up for their democracy right now. And I think that's important, you know, as an elected official and as a Marine Corps veteran, you know, I have a responsibility uh, to keep the community safe and free of oppression. So I want to speak to the bravery of, of all those uh, public servants, all those civilians who are fighting, all of the uh, electeds over there in Ukraine. I think we should just take a minute to just, you know, applaud them for their bravery to want to protect their uh, democracy right now. You know, and when you look at what's happening as far as the, uh, the conflict that's happening in Ukraine right now, uh, you look at, uh, and I want to tie it into how it's impacting this nation right now. Uh, we see that we're at a 40-year high inflation rate, uh, the cost of goods. And this is compounded, we know, because of um, COVID, a lot of people not going to work. But this, we're at like a 40-year high inflation. Um, the, we're at 7 8% some places, some places as high as 10% inflation rate. Um, I want to just with, like the rest of my colleagues here today, I want to offer my support uh, for President Joe Biden to invoke the Defense Production Act so that we can start to increase a clean energy transition. And I think somebody might ask the question, well, well what, how is that act going to help? Like, what is DPA going to do? And a lot of people may or may not know, but it authorizes the president to require companies to start to prioritize government contracts and orders seen as necessary for national defense with the goal of ensuring that the private sector is producing enough goods needed to meet war effort or other national emergency. It also authorizes the president to use loans, direct purchases, and other incentives to, incentives to boost the production of critical goods and essential materials. And I think as a nation, if we start to look at that, uh, we can start to begin to rely less on the fossil fuels that we've heard many of my colleagues here say it's is holding uh, Ukraine hostage. You know, we start to rely less on them from abroad and then open up ways in which we can use all the energy options that we have right here to reduce the burden that I think right now the average citizen is facing because of this inflation. So I support the United States also and taking an active role right now in helping to end this current crisis. And I condemn the unwarranted aggression of the Russian government. I also encourage all local leaders and anybody who calls themselves a leader to start to support humanitarian efforts of uh, everything that's happened over Ukraine. We uh, started a collection point here in, in Dumfries and our Northern Virginia Regional Commission where we're going to start collecting goods and things that are, are needed to help relieve the humanitarian issues on the front lines of this conflict. So I think we were supposed to just do a brief intro. I hope I didn't go uh, <laughs> too in depth, but I just wanted to piggyback on what some of my uh, colleagues were saying. I thought it was uh, important. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think that that's a great segue into our Q and answer section here, uh, particularly because one of the questions we have uh, was around, uh, is there any precedent for the Defense Production Act uh, being used in emergencies recently um, successfully? And so as, just as a background, um, if you're in the media, feel free to put uh, questions in the Q&A chat box, or you can raise your hand and we can bring you into the discussion if you'd like to ask uh, your question on camera. Um, so with that, um, I'll just throw the question out there to anyone who would like to answer it. Um, where has the DPA been used successfully in the past? Is there precedent for doing this? Doctor. 
Uh, sure. Hi. Thanks, Alex. I'll just throw in the most recent, um, only because I had worked in multiple administrations. Uh, and so we had to use it for during COVID. Uh, basically, there, as everyone knows, there was a shortage of masks. There was a shortage of, of uh, materials that were needed for um, our medical professionals. Um, and so we were able to direct uh, businesses, companies um, that retrofitted some of their, their plants uh, to help create you know, ventilators, for example. So there has been precedent um, uh, and, and the most recent one was COVID-19 and, and getting the materials necessary to, to create masks um, because a lot of that we were dependent on China, believe it or not, unfortunately. Uh, and so being able to bring that uh, home and having, having our, our US manufacturing uh, companies develop that here uh, was, was critical. Yeah, and now we have a lot of masks. So, and the, the interesting point about it is that a good one you make is that while doing that, we're boosting our own economy at the same time and making ourselves more resilient. Um, so there's multiple win-wins to this. Um, and another place it was used is combating the fires in the uh, out west. So that was another successful uh, usage of the DPA. So there's plenty of precedence to this. And there's right. another aspect to it, Alex, if I can really quickly. Um, uh, I, I saw a chart one time. One of the unique things about sustainable energy is it, uh, it gets cheaper the, the more you expand the infrastructure to produce it because the energy source itself is free and, and limitless, whereas all other forms of energy um, have, have, are limited. And as they become scarcer, they become more expensive. And so the cost of being able to produce them and ship them to the point of, of, of usage is more and more expensive. So as we expand the sustainable energy industry, the actual cost of that injury and uh, in industry and obtaining that energy is going to go down, not up. And it's one of the it, it's the only only energy source that it really acts that way. So the Defense Production Act could be used to prime the pump to demonstrate to large segments of the population if we do this and if we expand this it actually will have an effect. And so part of the problem is convincing everybody. It's changing a habit pattern. I live in an auto-centric suburbia that we're trying to, we're getting a new metro stop. So we've got to educate people, stop using your automobiles, start using your bikes, start using transit. We have it here. So it's a matter of re-educating your population. The Defense Production Act could be used to really rapidly ramp up the re-education of the population into the possibilities, the employment possibilities, labor unions could get involved. It could really be used to prime the pump to, to transition the, the economy. Absolutely. And so kind of a follow-up question to that is, clearly we can see how the DPA can affect and improve America's resiliency and economy, uh, but how would this necessarily help Europe? I would like to answer that question because um, there was another one that came up earlier as well. So the United States has always been the leader when it comes to many technologies and everything. And how does this impact? How can we impact Europe? Well, first of all, we need to produce those uh, that technology in order to attract other uh, countries throughout the world. If we let the production and led in that when it comes to uh, energy transition, that would easily uh, convince our allies, for instance, for instance, to, let's start off with NATO, uh, that this would be a pathway to ensure that uh, lessen their reliance on fossil fuels and, and oil. But we need to do that first. And that's why enacting the, enacting the DPA is important. So that way we can start the production of uh, clean energy now and not wait till later on. And eventually when they see how effective it is here in the United States and everything, everybody follows our lead eventually after uh, time goes by. But that is one way to get Europe to uh, start realizing that there is alternatives, but we need to be the ones that lead that, lead that uh, first. And we can't do it until we uh, invest more into clean energy and showing that, you know what, the jobs that it creates, most importantly, uh, and the cleaning the environment as well, and then eventually not relying on fossil fuels and oil. Uh, that is really important and we can do it and we need to do it because once again, the United States has always been the world leader when it comes to new technology. That's so true. I mean, the US, when we decide to do something, we ramp up and do it quickly and well, right? 
Uh, we saw it in COVID and we've seen it in the past where we have offshore wind, floating offshore wind turbines that we could export to Europe um, that were very well developed here. We can put wind turbines up offshore in 18 months. Uh, we could be exporting um, the battery and the solar technology instead of leaving that up to China. Uh, so this would make us more resilient while improving Europe's energy security. Yeah, yeah Alex, and I think the, the important thing is we, we begin to, once we, we cut off that fossil fuel need, then we, you know, the ones who aren't our allies, we begin to, to hit them in the pocketbook pretty heavy. And, and, and a lot of people will start to see they don't need no dependency on their fossil fuels. And I think we'll create more allies and uh, the conflict wouldn't have been able to ramp up as much as it has now if there was less reliance on it right now. And we were taking the lead in that production. So I think that's all great points. Yeah. So kind of going along with that, um, there's a question here that um, looks at the connection between declaring a climate emergency and the uh, release of the Defense Production Act. Um, so how are, the, how are those connected? Um, so would President Biden declaring a climate emergency help the situation? Um, and if so, I would say why? I know the uh, doctor, you had a couple good comments um, in the intro that I think illustrates some of the need uh, for declaring a climate emergency. Um, yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I just, as long as we can make the clarification, I mean, I mean, climate and energy are two sides of the same coin. And right now, you know, everyday citizens and, and, and while some may think that climate change is long, far in the future, it, it's not, it's obviously now and real. Um, but how does that affect you at the home front, right? How does that affect, you know, your power, your electricity bills, um, you know, the gas prices and so forth. And so, uh, whether you call it a climate emergency or an energy security emergency, um, you know, we should have that option to, to be able to invoke uh, DPA or um, um, as long as we can, again, look at how we can increase our domestic supply and clean energy and so forth. So it's, it's kind of a situation with being able to educate those out there because, again, climate emergency can be mis misconstrued in so many different ways. And, um, it, uh, but again, at the end of the day, you know, the president can certainly, you know, invoke whatever t t term he wants um, in, in order to, to address these issues. So again, uh, some of it may be semantics, but, you know, when it comes to the climate issues, uh, I mean, it's, it, as you heard from everyone here today, whether it's on the water issues, the energy security elements, you know, the, dealing with the dictatorships, protecting democratic nations, um, it, all, it, all, it all is interconnected uh, in, in that sense. So um, again, this is certainly, a, a, it can be a very geopolitical situation and how the president wants to address that. But I, I would say um, the energy security aspect, which is obviously a big piece of climate change um, would be uh, really the, the term I would use uh, in order to invoke this. But I'm sure my colleagues may have other thoughts on that. <laughs> I, I agree um, uh, with those comments. I, I wanted to add, I mean, um, I think it's important that declaring a climate emergency is, is, is in some ways um, stating what he, he's already done in, in many ways. If you look at the federal government across the military, across all the services, um, it's the single biggest user of energy in the world. <laughs> the federal government and President Biden has directed the services and the agencies to um, rapidly reduce their carbon intensity um, much, much further ahead than any state or uh, agency directives. Um, and I think it's important um, if you look back in 1973, um, Secretary of State Blinken's counterpart Henry Kissinger went and visited all the OECD countries to join in a collaborative um, uh, way to deal with the climate crisis that that we that we still live with today. Now, obviously, those connections uh, between developed OECD countries um, need to transition, um, obviously, in their response to oil crises. But I I think formalizing this as a climate emergency and then following up with our allies in, in a in a way that is similar to how we engage the crisis in 73 to go 
whether it's building it in NATO, building it in OECD, is, is building upon that declaration. And it, and it really, this is an appropriate time to declare that and, and then to sustain it in, in our um, diplomatic me measures. Yeah, that gets to, I think, um, the first question, which will be our last question, um, where we look at how can doing the, uh, enacting the DPA in a climate emergency avoid future risks like we're seeing now, um, like what we're seeing at the gas prices. Unfortunately, if China were to try to do something in the uh, Pacific, um, how would this avoid, alleviate the potential for conflicts in other parts of the world? I, I would just like to, to say, and, and I, I don't know if it's Derek or, or, or Mike or, or Richard who brought it up, but um, the one beautiful thing about renewables, and, and, and let me just first dispel any um, idea that um, we will ever be completely immune from future energy crises, no matter what type of energy we go to. I think it's important to be realistic about that. I do wholeheartedly believe um, relying uh, on renewables makes us less vulnerable. But as, they, as was mentioned earlier, there's such a diversity of supplies from wind energy, kin kinetic energy, right? From solar energy, from uh, different types of nuclear fission um, energies, um, geothermal, uh, hydro <laughs> hydro tidal currents, um, and if you kind of put all these together, um, you realize that we have security and diversification, uh, which you don't have with hydrocarbons. And we're seeing that play out, I think, pretty pointedly right now. Yeah, and I, 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 think, um, I think we need to kickstart the effort. We, we need a bold action. Um, we're all nipping around the edges. Globally, we're all nipping around the edges. I think now, it kind of a flip side um, silver lining. I, I, that's too that's too optimistic of the of the horror that's going on in Ukraine right now. But one aspect of it that is more positive is the fact that it's met, it brought everybody. It's brought into specific relief. Just exactly. Sorry, that's my dog. How how um, how vulnerable Europe, especially, but the whole world is to over dependence on fossil fuels. Um, it it it. Everybody's aware of it now. So if ever there was a time for some bold paradigm shift in, in how we think, instead of just thinking, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can in my neighborhood, do something bold. I think a, a declaring a climate emergency and invoking the DPA would get everybody's attention. It would change the paradigm. It would shift the whole framework of how we're thinking about this and get us out of this, this sort of nickel and dime mentality that we all collectively had into something saying, we really, really need to make this change and I'm serious about it. So it, I, I just think it's a good, it's a good attention getter. And I'd like to comment and, and uh, one thing is right here, you have elected leaders who are really concerned, who are, um, are part of this, but we need to hold all elected officials accountable as well. And the only way we do that is by asking them the hard questions, asking them why are they supporting the policies that they do. If they're not supporting policies uh, to address this crisis, the global warming, the uh, uh, and everything associated with this, because the reliance on fossil fuels, we really need to hold them accountable. And right now, we have two elected officials that are blocking the path to having a bigger discussion on that. And unfortunately, one of them's from Arizona, Senator Cinema, as well as Senator Manchin. Bringing and having more forums, yes, and having a bigger discussion on, this is what I believe the majority of people are concerned about. This war has highlighted the importance of what we need to do better uh, to stop the war machine. Like I said, this isn't the only war that involved oil. We too were in another crisis that involved oil. It is time to have the bigger discussion and say our continuous reliance on fossil fuels and oil is leading to bigger conflicts. And this is just the beginning because as we see global warming, it's impacting droughts, it's impacting our water. We're talking more of water security now. And that's what really impacts all of us at the end of the day. Without the lack of water, we're not gonna be able to survive. We're not gonna be able to grow our crops. We're not gonna be able to do many things. 
So it is time to take those major investments and start holding elected leaders accountable. But most importantly, relying on the transition to clean energy that we protect what we currently have when it comes to working families. Because at the end of the day, who's getting bear with the brunt of all this? Our working families with higher energy costs and higher water uh, prices. So we need to act today and we need to do that by holding elected officials accountable as well. So thank you. Thank you. Doctor, did you have something? Uh, no, it's just something when I was listening to Joel speak about the renewal, different types of renewables as well as nuclear, which I fully agree. Um, the other piece of low hanging fruit, I think everyone will agree upon uh, that will help with energy demand is energy efficiency. We can't forget that that low hanging fruit is something that can certainly affect um, our environment, the, our, our climate, um, as well as uh, energy demand. And so being able to utilize new energy efficiency technologies, would, no matter what kind of energy use that you're using, um, could certainly make a difference. And I know this is something that, that could be shared uh, with Europe um, as our largest trading partner. Um, so there's, there's definitely that, uh, that avenue uh, that we tend to forget. So just keeping that in mind. Thank you. Yeah, and as Europe is our largest trading partner, they're the largest economic bloc in the world, right? They're like $41 trillion, and we're the largest economy in the world. Together, we can absolutely do this and make our world uh, more secure. Um, and making the despots like Putin um, really uh, starving for the resources they need and uh, allow their people to be uplifted and uh, fight for democracy. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here, actually. Uh, and we have like uh, council member, um, sorry, Supervisor Turner mentioned, this is an opportunity for a paradigm shift um, to do this right now. So that's the exciting bit um, that I'm excited about. And I really appreciate everyone here uh, for taking the time to highlight the importance, the urgency uh, on World Water Day of increasing our international uh, security at home and abroad.